So in this video, we're going to be trying to draw out some implications of the existence of performatives. Why is it important? Obviously, they're kind of interesting to think about, but do they tell us anything super interesting about language more generally? We're going to focus on the challenge that they pose to what we might call the grammatical view of speech acts. So the grammatical view, it's not something that Austin talks about in that way. It's only sort of implicit. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time first saying what, what I understand the grammatical view to be. As I understand the grammatical view, what it says is that there's a relationship between the mood of a sentence, which is a fact about its grammar, and the kind of thing that the sentence is used to do. So let's talk about mood first. As, as we're going to use the term, there are basically three moods. There are basically three different sentence moods. There's declarative. And that's things of the form like the cat sat on the mat. That's an example of a declarative sentence. It's raining, I'm hungry, some turtles like jazz. These are all examples of declarative sentences. There's also imperatives, which we've talked a little bit about as well. So these are sentences like close the door, or don't touch that, And you can see one of the grammatical differences is, the, is in the verb. The verb appears in a special form, and there's also no obvious subject. So the subject of a sentence like that is the cat. What's the subject in the sentence, close the door? It doesn't really seem to make sense that saying is a subject in the same way. So these are imperatives. And then finally, there are what we're going to call interrogatives. So examples of interrogatives are things like, what's your name? Where are you from? What's the weather like today? These kind of question sentences. What's your name? Is it raining? Things like that. And what's special about these grammatically is, well, sometimes they have these what we might call question words, so like what, where, when, who, etc. And when they don't contain question verbs, there is a sort of inversion of the subject and the verb. Well, we talked about this a few months ago now. We know it's a, if we remember the discussion of Chomsky on questions, it's a little bit more complicated. But one thing that seems, one difference between a sentence like is it raining and it is raining, is that the question version of it sort of flips around the verb and the subject. We'll take the sentence, the cat sat on the mat, the question version of that, did the cat sit on the mat, sort of flips around the verb and the subject of the sentence. So these sentences are all grammatically quite different. If you even just focus, before we even focus on what they mean, before we even focus on what they're used to do, we can see that there are differences in their grammar. And the grammatical view says that the difference in grammar is basically coordinated with a different kind of thing each sentence is used to do. Because on the grammatical view, these things we're calling declaratives are used to make assertions or make claims. For imperatives, imperatives are used to make orders. And interrogatives, of course, are used to make questions, or ask questions. So this is what we call the grammatical mood. So this is what we call the grammatical view. And the basic idea of the grammatical view is it's baked into the grammar of all, all these different kinds of sentences, what the sentences are supposed to do. So that's the grammatical view. Now, if we think about it, we can see that performatives, the kinds of claims we've just been talking about in the last video, look like they cause a problem for this view. Now, they don't fit, cause a problem for the grammatical view as applied to imperatives or as applied to interrogatives, but they do seem to cause a problem when we think about declaratives. Because remember what we said, or what, how Austin characterized performatives. He said, when you a performative tends to be a sentence that 
appears in the declarative mood, that i.e. grammatically it looks like sentences of the form the cat sat on the mat, but it's not used to make an assertion. So a performative, you know, like I hereby name this ship, dot dot dot, that's not used to make an assertion according to Austin, rather it's used to name a ship. And naming a ship is a very different thing from making an assertion. If you want to be convinced of why, of why naming a ship must be different from making an assertion, and in particular must be different from saying what the name of the ship is, well, lots of people can go around saying what the name of a ship is. They can say, oh, that ship, that's Bodie McBoatface. But it's not the case that every time they do that, they're naming the ship. Rather, there's one event of naming the ship, and then after that, people make assertions about what the ship is named. So naming a ship is not the same thing as making an assertion about what the name of the ship is. So this is where the performative challenge comes in. It comes in in the declarative sentences. There are some declarative sentences that don't seem to make assertions, rather they're used to do things like naming or marrying or pronouncing people guilty, things like that. So Austin does kind of consider a response on behalf of the grammatical view which brings out some, an, a further interesting feature of performatives. So the view he considers is the idea that, well, maybe when we say things like, I hereby name the ship, or I pronounce you man and wife, we really are reporting on something, but rather there's a kind of inner mental activity going on. So there's an inner mental act of naming, or an inner mental act of marrying two people, or an inner man mental act of pronouncing somebody guilty. There's some sort of, in every case of a performative, really there's some mental act that you're really just describing when you say the performative. Austin's objection to that is that if you think about how performatives work, it kind of doesn't really matter you know, what your intentions are, whether you succeed or not. So he takes the example of promising. So I say to you, I promise you I'll be at your cello recital. And imagine I, you know, unfortunately I'm I'm a bad character. I say I, I make. I say I promise I'm going to be at your cello recital, and I have no intention of being there. So I don't perform this mental act of promising, whatever that mental act is. Austin asks us to consider: Well, does that intuitively matter for whether you have promised? Does the fact that you didn't sort of in your in in your head make the promise does that matter as to whether you have actually made the promise or not? And it looks like the answer is no. It doesn't actually matter whether I, you know, whether I intend to follow through, whether I have actually promised. As long as I say the words, I promise I'll do this, that alone is enough to promise. As it doesn't matter whether I intend to do so or not. I mean, to bring out a little bit more why might, that might be the case, suppose I, you know, I didn't turn up and you said, where were you? You promised you'd be there. It would be a pretty lame response on my behalf to say, Oh yeah, I just said that, but I didn't really do it in my I didn't do the promising in my head, so so I actually didn't promise. I think the re the response to that would rightly be, no, you did promise because you said the words I promise. That's what it takes to make a promise. So that does to seem to dispose of the describing an inner state view. It does seem to dispose of this way of trying to rescue the grammatical view. Now, I don't think that way to try and rescue the grammatical view was really particularly strong in the first place. It's rather Austin's reply seems to bring out an important feature of performatives, which is that basically what your intentions actually are don't really seem to matter a huge amount for whether you count as being successful. So at this stage of the, of the book, How to Do Things With Words, Austin sort of proposes a sort of inter, intermediate view. Now, it's not going to be his final view, but a sort of revised view about what's going on here. And the view is basically that there are two different kinds of things that can be done with a declarative sentence. If the use of it is a constantive, then it makes an assertion. If it's a performative, then it does something. And we've seen the kinds of things that performatives can do already. Now the important question at this point is like, well, okay, so maybe sentences have these two uses, so maybe some declaratives are these, make these constative utterances which make assertions, and these other ones are performatives which do something. But the obvious question is, well, 
why is there a difference? You know, what makes it the case that some make assertions that other things do something? And Austin's view seems to be that, well, especially with the performatives, the reason why certain sentences are performative, that the reason why certain sentences do something rather than just make assertions, is that there are just certain conventions that operate that say, well, when you say something, then you count as having done something else. So let's maybe like write down a version of what that convention like that might look like. So the marrying convention might be something like when somebody who's ordained says, I pronounce you married or whatever, then they are married. Now, it will have to be more complicated than that, really. Like, the two people will have to be of a certain age, they'll have to be consenting to, to being married to each other, and things like that. So the convention will be a little bit more complicated, well, actually, probably a lot more complicated, but there's some sort of convention which says, when somebody's ordained, says I pronounce you married, and when a bunch of other conditions are fulfilled, like the people are of the right age, they consent, and things like that, then they are married, then they count as being married. So there's just a convention in place that says that. And you can see how the conventions for things like naming and for pronouncing people guilty might go as well. So when somebody with a particular kind of status in a particular kind of situation says, I hereby name this ship Bodie McBoatface, then that ship becomes named. So that, that's another kind of convention. So let's go back to our picture, which is now the... which is sort of the first Austinian picture we have. What you can do with the declarative sort of splits, they can be performatives or constatives, what makes something performative? Well, it's the fact that there is a certain kind of convention that that sort of statement plays into. And I think the basic idea is that when there isn't a convention like that, the, the default is that you make an assertion. So that's the intermediate view that Austin gives. Now, as we're going to see, he actually doesn't really like this view in the end because he thinks it's actually much harder to draw a clear distinction between performatives and constatives than you might think. So eventually he's going to really kind of abandon this distinction. He's not going to think, he's going to think it's not really well formed. But that's sort of the intermediate picture. And certainly it's different from the grammatical picture. Because in the grammatical picture, there was a one-to-one -one relationship between the mood of a sentence and the thing the sentence is used to do. And that idea has been now abandoned in this intermediate Austinian picture. A reply though I do want you to think about, and I think it is going to be important, particularly in the weeks to come, is a different and I think somewhat stronger reply on behalf of the grammatical view. So performatives are supposed to be examples of declarative sentences that are used in a way that don't make assertions. Now I think it's pretty clear that performatives do do something that normal assertions don't. When I say I hereby name the ship Bodie McBoatface, there's something different that I'm doing there than when I say something like the cat is sitting on the mat. But one question I want you guys to think about is, a different diagnosis might be, well actually, in the case of performatives, there's two things I'm doing. I'm sure I'm doing something like naming a ship, but I'm also making an assertion. And maybe I'm naming the ship precisely because I'm making an assertion. So in this view, this would be a way to try and defend the grammatical view. It would be saying, well actually, it's not right to say performatives don't involve making assertions. They do involve making assertions. They just involve doing something extra as well. And maybe that something extra has nothing to do with the, with the meanings or anything like that. It's just an extra convention that sort of sits on top of the, of, of the way that language is supposed to be used. So that's something for you guys to think about. What, which way do you prefer to think about what's going on in the case of performatives? Do you think it's right to say that when I say something like, you, I pronounce you married, am I only doing something like marrying the two people? Or am I doing two things? Am I asserting that they're married and also marrying them? And maybe doing the second thing because I'm doing the first. So that's a question we're going to pick up in particular, probably talk about on Thursday.